Amen. <clears throat> Good evening. God bless you. Tonight's Friday night, and uh, I'm here to minister to you on the fruit of the Spirit. When you think about fruit, I'm thinking about my backyard, and uh, my neighbor has a uh, grapevine. And this grapevine starts out as uh, ragged, dry, and uh, once the sun starts shining, the rain comes and they water it, uh, the leaves begin to change color and they become green and little by little as the season goes on it becomes fruitful and eventually it uh, grows grapes. Well, uh, there are elements that God uses in order to uh, give us the ability to grow. And there are seven or ten elements that he utilizes, rather. And I want to turn to Galatians chapter 5. Turn to Galatians 5. <clears throat> I'm going to read 22 through 26. And it goes like this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's nine items. And as we see what God talks about in this, he goes on to say, against such there is no law. So there's not anything that is a negative when it comes to utilizing those items of fruit. And it's a spiritual fruit. It's something that has to come out of a human. It, it's nothing that you can grab outside of uh, just inside you. It has to be uh, become uh, uh, tilled and, and worked on. And, uh, and it must become built up. So it says that, it says against such there is no law. But in 24 it uh, begins to go, and those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So the item, the, the, the area is the flesh. How do you become fruitful? You must uh, get rid of the passion and desires. And it says that you have to live in the Spirit. What exactly does that mean, living in the Spirit? Well, it means that you have to begin to be more spiritually attuned and aware. And it says in 25, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. So it obviously tells us that our lives have to operate in the Spirit and that we can't become so spiritual that we become arrogant, conceited, uh, and, and we can't become so spiritual that we provoke others or one another. And we can't become so spiritual or non-spiritual that we begin to envy each other or anyone for that matter. Ephesians 5 9 says this, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. So good, right, and true. We must live and walk in the Spirit. Why so that we don't fall into the temptation of this conceit, provocation, and en envy? Galatians 5.17 tells us this, For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and they're contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. In other words, you desire to want to do something, 
but you can't do it because you're at war. You're at war with your spirit and you're at war with your flesh. So stop the self infighting in your own self and then begin to work on those around you. When I talk about these nine spirits of, of fruit and uh, first one is love and what it is is it's agape, a brotherly love. Ag agape love is something that God gives to you and uh, what agape is, is uh, it's love and it's it, affection which is benevolence. In other words, your love and affection is helping your brother. And also, it's charity love. That's what agape love is. Charity, caris, what that is simply is a love that is willing to give of themselves, mainly of yourself, not so much just giving items. It's, it's it kind of like uh, buying off your children. You can't do that. With this kind of spiritual love, it's something that you have to give out of you to someone. It's comforting when uh, they need comfort. It's helping when they need help. It's in you individually. And uh, John 15, 13 says this, Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. That's true love, church. Greater love has no man than this, that you lay your life down for your friend. Not your brother, your friend. Your friend means that uh, there's not quite as much blood affection, but God is telling us that we need to learn to lay down our lives. I don't believe that God is saying die. In some cases, he does mean that. But I mean that God is saying sacrifice. The next uh, fruit of the Spirit is joy. And joy is kara. Kara is a joy of gladness that you receive. Uh, joy is something that gives you pleasure in your spirit and it's something that you receive. It's a cheerfulness and it's a delight. We have to learn to be delightful people and cheerful. It's like eating some good fruit. It's such a delight when you need or desire fruit. Well, that's you when someone needs you and someone needs your just your your body there, just the fact that you care enough to go. That's all they need. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 13, the Word of God says, Therefore, we have been comforted in your comfort. Did you catch that? We have been comforted in your comfort. Wow. And we rejoiced exceedingly more for the joy of Titus because his spirit has been refreshed by you all. So this is going on and uh, Paul is talking about one of his disciples because his disciples said that when I went to Corinth, they treated me with such joy, such love, that uh, there's nothing more I could do. I was comforted in their comfort. The next uh, fruit of the Spirit is peace. Peace is Aranyai. Aranyai is an exemption of rage and war. So in peace, you'll never have rage. In peace, there will never be war in you. In peace, you will never 
uh, want to come against an individual. This kind of peace is best found in Galatians chapter 1, verse 3, when uh, Paul said to the Galatia church, Grace to you and peace from God our Father, Lord Jesus Christ. Galatia was going through a lot at that time. Paul knew it. He wrote to them, and he wanted them to have this exemption of rage in their house, in their life. And so he writes this greeting to them. What a powerful thought and word that we see taking place. The uh, next item, the fourth uh, fruit of the Spirit, is long-suffering. What long-suffering is in the Greek is mako. Macro thrumea, macro thrumea, an endurance and perseverance. So long suffering is in something that is a uh, cross country run in your life. It's not a quarter mile. It's something that you endure. It uh, you persevere in, and when you persevere, when you go through this uh, this macromea, macrothumea. When you go through this long suffering and, and you go and you face issues and uh, you persevere and you fight and march through and this battle goes on to uh, move in your life, it's a pretty powerful item that uh, is utilized in a man's heart. Hebrews 6.12 says this, Don't be slothful, okay, or in, but endure. Slothful, that's what sluggish means. But in Hebrews 6.12, it says that you do not become sluggish or slothful, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. He's really telling us something important here. He's saying you can't, um, you can't step aside. You can't be inactive. You can't move at a slow pace and at your pace. You have to move in Christ's pace. And when you move in Christ's pace, what it does is it, it is an action of faith. But what it builds is patience and it gives you an inheritance of the promises. An inheritance of the promises. The sixth item that we see in, uh, in the fruit of the Spirit is kindness. When we see this kindness, what kindness is is krastotas, krastotas, or good with integrity. That's what kindness is. That's, that's pretty interesting. Good, that means that you're doing right and you're being uh, honorable, but you're doing it with integrity. In other words, you're not uh, smiling but angry inside. You're sincere internally, and your integrity flows out. And in Romans 2.4, it tells us, Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? So look what it's telling us. Don't despise the riches of God's goodness. I've seen some people literally get jealous of their spouse because their spouse is so in love with Christ. You ever seen that? Or have you ever been there? Putting, uh, it's almost like uh, your spouse fasting or praying, and you know that when they fast, it's going to cost you too. And when they're constantly praying 
it's like, well, how am I going to get a conversation in? And what happens is uh, the uh, demons, those lying devils, they come in and cause you to despise God's goodness. And then he goes on, uh, the riches of his goodness, forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. So eventually, God's goodness is going to make you repent of your way and cause you to become a child of God. Pretty heavy. And as we go into this uh, sixth or seventh uh, item uh, of the fruit of the Spirit, the seventh item is goodness. It was kindness, now there's goodness. And uh, goodness is agthro suna, or an upright heart. Uh, when you think of upright, I think of a heart just kind of, here's a heart, but it's kind of slumping. And uh, the heart is not in love with what it's doing. But an upright heart begins to become like this. It rises up. And it's, uh, it's almost like a puppy seeing its master. It gets excited. And it rises to that level of joy. And that's what goodness is, is it's, it's an upright heart to do the things of God in the spiritual manner of your life. Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 11 says this. It says, Therefore, we also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of his calling and fulfill all the good pleasures of his goodness and the work of faith with power. Therefore, we also pray always for you. Okay, so the Thessalonians were receiving this, and uh, Paul was writing to them in Thessalonica, Thessalonica, Thessalonica. He was writing to the Thessalonians and saying, we also pray always for you that God's going to count you worthy of this calling, a calling that they had to reach the lost and a calling to uh, bring new souls into the, the flock and uh, a calling that was going to fulfill all the good pleasure of God's goodness. So here the Thessalonian church was being so good and they were being so faithful that they were drawing souls in just by their uh, integrity and character. And uh, that the goodness of faith with power was emanating out of them. And it had become a pleasure because that power of faith was emanating from them. And it was the power of Christ. The, the eighth thing that the fruit of the Spirit brought out is faithfulness, pistis. Uh, pistis uh, is believing anything relating to God. Believing anything relating to God and His existence. That means that you believe that the walls of Jericho came down by the blowing of a shofar. That means that Peter walked on water and you believe it. That means that Abraham was going to uh, kill Isaac and God stopped him. That means that the Red Sea parted and you believe it. Anything doing or relating to God you believe. That's faithfulness. A faithfulness that when an individual is in need, you know you have this faithful love, this faithful understanding, this faithful drive to uh, go forward with what it is that God is doing in their life or going to do. This is powerful, church. Very powerful. And when, when we see this, we see that God, what he's 
uh, relating to us is in Mark 5.34. Mark 5.34 says this, and he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. <clears throat> God will remove the plague just like he's going to remove the coronavirus. He's going to remove the plague just like he's healed your loved ones. He's going to remove those issues that are coming against you in the manner that he removed the water where the Red Sea was so that the children of Israel could walk across. And guess what? Three and a half million people walked across. And guess what? The dry land, the land was dry. There was, and it was an easy walk. There weren't things in the way. It was clean, smooth, dry. And the children of Israel went across that. That's what we believe. And he told this young woman, he said, your faith has made you whole. That's what faithfulness is. And once she was whole, she faithfully served God because that became a part of her DNA because she began to walk in the fruit of the Spirit in meekness, in faithfulness. Meekness, church, is the final and ninth or, or uh, eighth thing. Meekness is preotas and what meekness is, is a mild way about you. A mild way about you. And what that mild way is humility. This is the eighth of those nine fruits of the Spirit. I got the others wrong, but that's okay. Point is, is that meekness, what that is, is humility. Jesus Christ was meek. He said that Moses was the meekest man on the face of the earth. That means that uh, you're not concerned with you, you're concerned with you. And once this occurred in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, the scripture said this, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fall, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one, in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Whoa. God's telling us in Galatians, he's saying, uh, if, if you know somebody that is overtaken by fault or accused, he says that you're spiritual. You go and help restore them. And the way you restore them is humility meekness and not considering yourself but considering that other person and the final is self-control one of the most difficult things mankind faces and what that self-control is is en krata ah, en krata en kratia one who masters his desires have you ever wanted something but you just refused to go after it? You ever wanted to do something but you said, no, I'm not going to allow my desires to have the best of me. That's what this is. Acts 24, 25 says this. As Paul talked about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid. That's enough for now. You may leave. When I find it convenient, I will send for you. That's heavy. Felix was so convicted by Paul's self-control that it made him say, I can't do this. I can't be around you because you are able to take what I dish out to you. And I, don't, I can't handle that. And so Paul, in his power and love, he just stayed the course and did what God had set for him to do. And he finished his 
path to Rome. There in Rome he died, but Paul walked in the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The nine fruits of the Spirit. Walk in them, church. Live them. Let them be a part of your inner character. Remember, it's spirit and it's fruit inside. Let it happen to you. May you be good ground. May you be a valuable tool. May you be key to the kingdom business. Go out, spread your fruit. God bless you. Love you. Josie and I, New Hope in Christ, we'll see you Sunday. Father, I pray for the body of Christ, for their lives and their fruitfulness. And if you want to give your life to Jesus, pray with me. Say, Dear Lord, I admit that I am a sinner. I ask Jesus, come into my heart, save me, change me, and set me free from the bondages of sin, death, and hell. Be my God, and I will be your servant. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you Sunday. And remember that the King of Kings loves you, and he resides in you. What a good God we serve. Good night.